Good morning. Welcome. My name is Heather Walker. I am the daughter of Rodney Yukton and Sherry Gamble. I'm an enrolled member of the Chehalis Indian Reservation and also a descendant of the Quinault Indian Nation. I'm honored to stand before you as a representative of my family and my ancestors who have come before me. I would like to do two things this morning. One is to acknowledge the first peoples of this land on which we gather today. And the second is to offer a blessing so we can open this event in a good way. Today we gather on the ancestral homelands of many Coast Salish peoples who have lived here since time immemorial. Some of their ancestors signed treaties, such as the Point Elliott Treaty or the Medicine Creek Treaty. Today, you may know them by their modern affiliations, such as Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot. Perhaps you might know them as Snoqualmie, Puyallup, Stillaguamish, Tulalip, Swinomish, Nisqually. We also have many urban Indians who have moved to this landscape and called Seattle their home for many generations. Myself am now included in that category. This acknowledgement is tremendously complex and I would like to give honor and respect to that complexity. <clears throat> With that, I thank each and every one of these tribal nations for thousands and thousands of years of caring for our sacred waterways and our land. I raise my hands to you, my friends, my relatives, and all those that have come before and will come after. Whenever tribal people gather, they offer a blessing as a part of carrying on traditions to ensure that our cultural values continue. It is a way of life. We do this with the expectation that something is happening. This morning, I offer you a blessing with the expectation that indeed something is happening, that ears, eyes, and most importantly, our hearts are open. Please hear this in the spirit in which it is offered, and if you are moved to do so, please join me with your spirit as well. Quaxman non Satanon Satis on the spray, oh my sister. I humbly come before you and welcome you to join us in this place. I thank you for bringing us here together safely and for looking after our loved ones so that we can do our business here today free from worry. Ancestors, we ask that you join us and bring your wisdom and spirit among us. Join us together in one heart and one mind. Today I ask that you open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, and open our hearts so that we may join each other in vision and purpose, moving forward in a good and meaningful way. Immerse us in your love, and if needed, grab us by the scruff of the neck and shake up our imaginations. Open our minds so there is room for creativity and understanding. Do not let us remain the same, but let us leave this place forever changed. Lift up each and every one of us today and every day. Help us build a network of support among one another so we have the strength to continue to do good work. Lift up our leaders, protect them, guide them, and give them strength of our ancestors. Open their ears, open their eyes, and open their hearts, and shake them up a bit too, so their imaginations and understand and creativity flow in positive ways. Teach us to love one another and to provide greater understanding that each and every one is important and not one is unimportant. Bless each and every one that has participated in making this gathering possible. Bless those that have given of themselves so that we can share this moment together. All of those that have inspired one another have given their time and their resources. And all those that have helped to feed our spirits, our minds, and our bodies, I thank them and ask special blessings for them. Today, when our work here is done, assist us in remembering and calling upon these lessons for all of time. And I thank you for being here. Quaxman non Satanon Satisan to spray. Oh, my sister. Next, I would like to uh, welcome Ben 
Le oh, I had it a minute ago. Uh, ben Leatua Taua. Um, so he is next. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Ben Leotowo. I work as the manager here at the Rainier Arts Center. On behalf of SEED and SEED Arts, I'd like to thank Mayor Durkin and her team for the huge honor of having the State of the City address here in the heart of South Seattle, Columbia City. I want to tell you a little bit about Rainier Arts Center. Our mission is to produce and facilitate a variety of artistic and cultural productions that are supported by our community. Throughout the year, you can visit and participate in a range of concerts, educational programs, theater, literary events, and world and dance music. Rainier Arts Center is Southeast Seattle's premier performing arts center, and we promote outstanding performances, encouraging cultural dialogue, as well as celebrating diversity. Today, we have for you one of those outstanding performances. Wei Wei Lee, the 2019-2020 Seattle Youth Poet Laureate, will now recite a poem for you. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. I have a poem for you guys today. Art form. Like our art forms, we ourselves are art forms. Like mosaic, we are vibrant pieces forming a more splendid picture. No fragment too small for our blank corners. Like tapestries, we are mere threads alone. But woven, we become a marvel. Like our art forms, we are never ugly, only seen from different angles. Like our art forms, we are better shown in collection, together. Let us be a pencil sketch on leftover butcher paper. Let us be white canvas painted with white strokes. Let us be shattered pottery mended with gold. Let us be fluid twisting sculptures gleaming with chrome. And above all, let us be known. Next up, welcome Anthony Garcia. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Today, I just want to talk about um, my internship opportunity that I had with uh, Seattle Promise and, and being a student at South Seattle College. I uh, had a great uh, opportunity being an intern at Amazon Web Services, and I just want to talk about how much it helped me become the person I am today. Um, I learned many lessons. For example, I learned how big companies work. Obviously, Amazon is one of the biggest companies in the world, and how they hire people is, is very important. They have a very extensive hiring process, and I learned very important interview skills that set me apart from, from who I was before, because I did not know these things. And like I said, it is important, because in high school, like. Pretty much your main goal is to have fun and get good grades, you know? But once you enter college, you kind of realize that you're put into the real world by yourself, pretty much. And it is important for these um, college students to get opportunities like internships and just learn these big things because you're going to have to learn what your passion is. And I'm so excited and blessed to have this opportunity to represent the Promise Scholarship because um, I figured out what my passion is. And my passion is a uh, business. I want to be a businessman. I want to be an entrepreneur. And um, that's what I want to do. So I'm like completely blessed that I had this head start. And now that I have gained this knowledge and wisdom, I am planning to transfer into a four year university uh, thanks to it. So it has motivated me so much. And, and because of that, I'm not sure which university yet, but I'm going to plan that out. <laughs> and. Um, like I said, I'm extremely excited that so many other students will get this opportunity like I did because here in the city of Seattle, we're a community and we have to build each other up. 
like for, for generations, not just one generation, but for multiple generations to come. So I want to thank you guys for letting me talk. And now I want to introduce the one and only uh, Mayor Jenny Durkin. Thank you, Heather and Weiwei. That was a really wonderful opening, the blessing in the poem. Anthony, thank you for that great introduction uh, and for sharing your story. You folks are amazing. Uh, Weiwei and Anthony, I see some future employers down here if you've got your resume. Um, make sure you have it. Members of the City Council, my fellow elected officials from around the state, veterans, community leaders, members of the clergy, tribal members, my cabinet members, and my family and friends. Good morning. Good morning. It is so great to get out of City Hall. <laughs> and I really think that is the best way to remember why we do our jobs. And really, it is the only way we can do our jobs, getting out of City Hall. I also want to say a special thank you to Ben and the whole amazing host team at the Rainier Arts Center. This is really a special place in Seattle. Let's give him a round of applause. I mean, if you've been here, you know you can see some of the young, amazing actors perform classics like Les Mis or The Power of the Arts. This place really reflects the community. It's filled with creativity, engaged people, big ideas, and yes, lots of love. Ben wanted me to plug, they're gonna remodel and reopen, so make sure you come back. Um, this place shows the power of partnership. Community and nonprofits, government, working together to make progress on our shared goals. And today, that's exactly what I'd like to talk to you about taking action, and making progress. In the last two years, together, we have taken bold actions to make our progressive values real in people's lives. Because of our shared actions and commitment, I can tell you, today, the state of our city is strong and resilient. Yes, we have challenges, but we have the values, the talent, and the determination to meet them. It is important to remember that progress is rarely easy. It often means setbacks, and progress takes the tireless work, commitment, and the remarkable vision of remarkable people. And here in Seattle, we stand on the shoulders of giants. One of them is here with us today. His name is Larry Gossett. I'd like you to remember this is the day of my speech, but it is proclaimed Larry Gossett Day. You know, from UW's Black Student Union days to his decades on the King County Council, Larry always knew who he was fighting for and what he was fighting for. And we are better because of him. Larry, thank you for your years of friendship and your service to our region and our country. But don't worry, my friend, we know that none of us are done fighting for justice. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Making progress is more important and more urgent than ever before. Seattle has grown so quickly that it feels like change happened to us 
instead of with us. People are worried about their place in our city and the futures of their families. I hear it everywhere I go in this city. And our country is at a crossroads. It is painfully divided in far too many ways. In this era of polarization and the constant chaos spilling out of that other Washington, here in Seattle, we can and we must do better. While our national politics are mired in acrimony, here in Seattle, we must choose a different path, and we have. We have stepped up to help our most vulnerable communities. We didn't just talk about the importance of family. We expanded access to affordable childcare and high-quality preschool. <laughs> and we don't just talk about eliminating inequities. We listen to community and today acknowledge and have taken action on the searing tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous women. We recognize the ongoing harms of systemic racism. We broaden the reach of our race and social justice in initiative. We eliminated fines in our libraries so that income would never be an obstacle to knowledge. And while others talk, talk about providing new opportunity for young people and preventing crushing student debt, we acted. We gave two free years of college for every Seattle Public High School student. We provided free transit passes to 14,000 students and low-income neighbors so they can have access to jobs and opportunity in all of Seattle. We didn't just talk about protecting workers. We gave 30,000 domestic workers new rights, including minimum wage, overtime, and breaks. <laughs> Together, we required that our Uber and Lyft drivers earn at least minimum wage. And we don't just talk about the need for more housing. We delivered with our partners nearly $1.5 billion in investments in more affordable housing. As your mayor, I work every day to translate our progressive values into real, concrete action that makes people's lives better, safer, and more just. Now, there's some that said we couldn't do it. We couldn't bring people together to do the big, hard things. But we have. We've done it together. In Seattle, we know talk is cheap. <laughs> Being progressive actually means making progress. And we have done it. And this year, we have a duty to keep doing just that. Now, we know that government, philanthropy, and employers have a shared responsibility to help our most vulnerable neighbors. We believe that in a region as prosperous as ours, no one should experience homelessness. And in a region as prosperous as ours, everyone should have access to safe and affordable housing. And that's why we have focused so much energy and action on our homelessness and housing crisis. This enormous challenge is a generation in the making, and there is much left to do. But it's important to know that we have also made progress. For the first time since 2012, the annual point in time count showed a decline. We have transformed our shelter system 
to one that provides more 24-7 services to help people and to provide a path to housing. We have provided permanent housing to more people than ever before. And with our regional partners, particularly with King County Executive Dow Constantine, we are beginning a new era in our fight against homelessness. A more unified regional approach to replace our fractured, siloed system. Thank you, Dow, for your partnership. For both our low-income and our middle-income neighbors, we need more affordable housing in every part of our city and every part of our region. We must do more. People who work in Seattle should be able to afford to live in Seattle. Just ask Christian Jordan. Christian is a nurse. He works in the neurology operating room at Swedish. Yes. He helps people with brain surgery. His girlfriend is a surgery technician at Swedish. They live together in Bremerton because that's where they could afford to live. But life-saving facts about our nurses and doctors and med techs is they spend many days on call, having to be ready to report to work in a moment's notice. For Christian and his girlfriend, that means being here in Seattle, near Swedish, ready to go. But because they live so far away, sometimes that means sleeping in their car or staying on a friend's couch or paying for a hotel. People like Christian, people who help care for the people of Seattle should be able to live in Seattle. <laughs> And that was for Christian, who couldn't be here, but he would say, yeah. <laughs> and that's why we took new, unprecedented steps to address our housing challenges. Together, we passed and implemented the mandatory housing affordability laws, pushed for more backyard cottages, invested new resources in community to combat displacement. We surged our investment in affordable housing for our low- and middle-income neighbors. Again, since becoming mayor, we have invested in nearly $1.5 billion of affordable housing. Now that's progress. <laughs> but we know it's not enough. We know we need more tools as a region. Seattle cannot and never will be able to solve affordability, homelessness, and housing if we continue to act alone, from Bellevue to South King County to all over this region, we have faced enormous growth in every city. And while we've seen immense prosperity, we've seen rising rents and more individuals experiencing homelessness. These problems do not know any city boundary. If we truly want to address housing and homelessness, we must act as a region. And at a time that the federal government has walked away from its responsibilities, cities need more support for public safety, behavioral health, and homelessness. Fortunately, legislators in Olympia have been working on a bold idea, a progressive business tax. This could give our region unprecedented new resources for affordable housing. I stand proudly with a broad coalition of legislators, labor unions, service providers, housing experts, and some of our region's small and large businesses, and others who all believe we must solve this problem and there is momentum behind a comprehensive countywide approach. I hope Olympia acts and our region does not miss this opportunity for real progress. <laughs> A 
Another area where we've made progress is treating the people who live and work in this great city as our customers and delivering better basic city services. From keeping people and goods moving through the Seattle squeeze and the Seattle freeze, to making sure your garbage, recycling, and compost is picked up, that you have clean and affordable power, that when you dial 911, someone comes, to filling the potholes. Okay, yes, I know there's more potholes, especially this time of year. Um, but when it snows, whether that's half an inch or 14 inches, or whether the smoke comes back again this summer, we will be prepared. We will communicate with you. We will show we are doing what we do, we know what we're doing, and we will keep you safe. That's all right. We are also making some progress in creating a Seattle economy that works for everyone. It's not easy. We're living through transformative change in our economy, and it's leaving way too many people behind. Growing economic inequality is a threat to everyone's future. We've taken real action to create an economy that works for everybody in Seattle and to create more ladders into the middle class. We started early with childcare. We doubled our children program so even parents and children have the support they need. Just think about what this means for Diamond Davis. Diamonds has a six-year-old son who is in, who's in child care at the Tiny Tot Center. I get to go later, later this afternoon. Diamond has been getting the help for the cost of child care from the state. But then she found out she wouldn't be eligible anymore. It could have been devastating. Except we, together, the city of Seattle acted, and she has another option, our child care assistance program. So Diamond's son is where he needs to be, in great childcare. And Diamond can go to work knowing her child is in a safe and nurturing place. Yeah. <laughs> because we wanted to make sure kids in Seattle could come to kindergarten ready to learn, we also made sure that families had access to high quality pre-K. And we created two years of free college, the Seattle Promise, because we believe in our youth and we believe in our students. And today, because we acted and have been working with the Seattle Public Schools as partners, we have made real progress together with them and the Seattle colleges. Today, 400 Seattle Promise students are attending one of the Seattle colleges. 400 students. <laughs> and at the application deadline last Friday, 1,800 high school students applied for Seattle Promise. That is astonishing. In two years, we have provided opportunity for hundreds of families in Seattle. And now we have to pair that opportunity with family wage jobs and full access to our economy and prosperity. <laughs> Anthony, we're going to do it for you and for everyone else. You heard Anthony talk about the internship problem we created. It gives students the chance to have paid, yes, paid internships at some of Seattle's most innovative companies and labor unions. They get to work towards their career goals and gain experience. And Anthony wasn't alone. Shenna Carrion is another one of those people. She couldn't be here today, but she is amazing. She's a native of the Philippines, emigrated here in 2014. It was tough because she was just learning to speak English. She had to work hard and she threw herself into clubs in her school work at her high school. And she did really well. Our Seattle Promise program made college a reality. She enrolled at Seattle Central, tuition paid, 
and is pursuing a degree in business. And last summer, she took advantage of the internship program and did a paid internship at Alaska Airlines. <laughs> After she earns her associate's degree, she plans to transfer to the UW to earn her four-year degree. And I have a feeling one day we may see her running Alaska Airlines. <laughs> Because of the success of this job pilot, this year we are going to quadruple the size of the program. We will launch a Seattle Promise job and career pathways. Someday we must provide opportunity to every youth living in Seattle. We want every student like Anthony and Shenna to have that opportunity. We also know we need to do more for others in Seattle. That includes workers. It includes the largest sector of the gig economy, our Uber and Lyft drivers. This year, we will make sure that they are paid at least minimum wage and that they have access to benefits they deserve, like paid sick leave. We will also launch a first-in-the-nation model for dispute resolution to provide fairness for drivers who are denied the opportunity to work. Now, we cannot build shared prosperity without helping, nurturing, and encouraging our small businesses. Here in Seattle, small businesses provide nearly 200,000 jobs. 200,000 jobs. That's like four Amazons. They are one of our most powerful economic engines. And that's why within days of becoming mayor, I created the city's first small business advisory council to make sure, yeah, are they here? We have to make sure that small businesses' voice are heard in City Hall and beyond. And working with those small business owners, I asked the city to study what are some specific ways we can break down the barriers for Seattle small businesses and help them in this really growing and unaffordable city. We need to help small business like Moy Macho, my favorite taco truck in South Park, it's owned by Judith Herrera, who couldn't be here because she's working, but she is awesome. And if you haven't been there, free advertising, go. <laughs> uh, for years, she's been running that business, which is such an important part of the South Park community. But last year, she faced some really hard times. And fortunately, the city was able to help. She qualified for a $25,000 grant through our Emergency Stabilization Fund so she could replace her coolers, keep her customers happy, and get her business back on track. And today I can announce that Seattle will take new steps to support our small businesses. First, we're going to increase that emergency fund for small businesses so we can help people trying to make their way here in Seattle. Second, we are going to speed up permitting. You're welcome, Nathan. No. <laughs> I've heard it too many times, how much it costs, how long it takes. We are, gonna, we are going to cut the time it takes for small business to get the permits they need. And we're going to find ways to streamline their costs. Starting with, we're going to cut what we charge for something that's important to every business, a storefront sign. As I said, standing up for our progressive values is not always easy. But it has never been more important. Few areas in our national life are more disheartening than how this federal government treats and demonizes immigrants. 
separating children from parents, denying basic food and needs, replacing hope with fear for our DACA youth. On this, our voices must be united and unwavering. We will continue, we will continue to welcome our immigrant and refugee neighbors into our communities. And we will make sure that our economy works for them too. There are so many reasons we want people to come out of the shadows and thrive in our city. Consider for a moment the 2020 census. A fair and complete count could mean significantly more federal resources for Seattle. For programs like Head Start, nutrition assistance, Medicare and Medicaid. Last year, we worked with our partners to invest millions of dollars in trusted community organizations like the Refugee Women's Alliance and Asian Counseling Referral Services and so many more to make sure that all communities could be counted. We want to thank those community partners for all of their work. And at the city, we know we can and will do more. This spring, at community centers all across the city, we will open a number of census assistance centers to ensure that everyone knows their rights and has a chance to be counted. And to every family, I say to you, you count. You count and you deserve to be counted. We know that one of the fundamental functions of our city government is to provide public safety. We must do more to increase public safety in our city. But to achieve this, we can't act like the other Washington. We can't create false choices in, if we really want to achieve holistic community safety. For many people, increased public safety means more police officers, changing our gun laws, and a criminal justice system that deals better with repeat offenders. Many others believe we need more economic opportunity for youth, more intervention and diversion programs, and more behavioral health treatment. And my answer is, we need all of the above. And we are so lucky that we have Chief Carmen Best and Chief Harold Scoggins at the helm of our police and fire departments. They understand. They get it. They understand the challenges of our growing city, and they are responding. They know and we know you cannot have true public safety without justice and equity. And that's why, in addition to historic investments in our police and firefighters, we have invested in restorative justice programs that focus on keeping young people out of the criminal legal system to begin with. Groups like Choose 180, Rainier Beach, a beautiful, safe place for youth, the Freedom Project, the Walk Away City Collaborative. These organizations and others are doing essential work. And it's also essential that we continue to increase our community-based policing, which is why we expanded the Seattle Police Department's Community Service Officer CSO program. We wanted to build stronger connections with residents and businesses in every community, not just when there's an emergency call. And I've had the chance to go out and walk with these CSOs. They are great additions to the city of Seattle. Many of them are here today. Welcome. Thank you. 
<clears throat> we are also working to fight a drug epidemic. We're educating people on the real dangers of fentanyl and counterfeit drugs. And we're making sure people have Narcan and training so they can help during an overdose. We know we must increase our ability to deliver emergency and non-emergency services. So this fall, we launched our new Health One pilot to help address those non-emergency 911 calls. We led the nation with Medic One, and today we have one of the best emergency response systems in the country. But a growing city needed a better way to deal with the increasing non-emergency but important calls. So Health One was born. This team of specially trained Seattle Fire Department members and social workers helps people downtown with behavioral health issues and non-emergency medical issues. The Health One unit includes two firefighters, Roger Weber and Matt Young, and two case managers, Ashley Clayton and Donna Andrews. Some of them are here today. I think we should give them a hand. Every day this team answers calls and helps those people in need. One day last fall, Health One responded to a call. A woman was found shivering on the sidewalk, but could not hear. The crew wrapped her in blankets, communicated with her in sign language, and Health One took her to a shelter and then connected her with a stabilization program. They are literally doing life-saving work. Thank you. I am very pleased to announce today that this summer we will launch a second Health One to expand service in the city of Seattle. <laughs> Seattle must continue to lead in taking action to make our community safer from gun violence. And that's why we put in place a new gun safety law and why last year, Chief Carmen Best and the Office of the Seattle Police Department, often working with our hard-working prosecutors in the city attorney's office, took over 1,100 guns off our streets. <laughs> but we know too many of our communities have been shattered by gun violence. Third and Pine, Lake City, Pritchard Beach, South Park, like so many of us, I am heartbroken by this violence. We cannot have community gathering places become places where people fear gunfire. <laughs> and we know there has been an increase in gun violence that's related to gun activity. To, to counter this, we need to continue to have better prevention and intervention, support the work of our police, change our gun laws at the state and federal level, <laughs> and continue to have the resources and coordination needed for a predictable and accountable criminal justice system. As Chief Best and the city continue to increase public safety downtown and everywhere in our city, we have to also be willing to try new things. Today, I can announce that as part of our comprehensive approach to public safety, we are investing in a new community response program. While the police investigate a scene and police and fire make people safe and arrest offenders, we will also have a new parallel community response. This new program will dispatch trained trusted community members to respond immediately after a shooting to hospitals, to neighborhoods, or hotspots. Their goal will be to calm tensions, support families and survivors, and stop these situations from escalating into retaliation or further acts of violence.
this approach has been effective in cities like Atlanta and Philadelphia, let's try it here in Seattle to see if it can make it better. So yes, we will continue to address our public safety challenges in every community in Seattle, but we will do it holistically. We can and we will do it better. Now, our progressive values must not only be reflected in our laws and policies, they must be reflected in how we build our city. In this 21st century, America's cities must be livable, vibrant, and connected places. And here, we are making great progress. We are adding density, particularly around transit. We are adding green spaces and public spaces. Just look at our waterfront. Step by step, we are reconnecting our city with our heart, Puget Sound. We are creating a true waterfront park for all with a 20-acre park for everyone in Seattle to call home. And Seattle Center is being reborn before our eyes. In the shadow of the Space Needle, a new world-class arena is taking shape. It will be home to our three-time WNBA champion, Seattle Storm. A new NHL team will compete at Seattle Center and practice at a reborn Northgate. The best artists in the world will perform at this new arena. In fact, Ben, I'll bet you, some of the amazing kids that perform here are gonna be on that stage too. But we know these civic treasures will mean little if we don't continue to address climate change. In Seattle, we continue to believe in science. We know we must make progress on tackling climate change. And that's why this year, starting our Youth Council, acting on a climate plan, and prioritizing the New Green Deal will happen. It's why I issued an executive order making sure that the city of Seattle will never again construct a building that relies on fossil fuels. We will lead by example and we will end, we will end dependence on fossil fuels in our lifetimes. We're making Seattle a place where your first choice can be taking transit, biking, walking, or rolling. We're building a safer and more connected bike network and we are reducing speed limits on our streets to make everyone safer. And it's not just because it will help us meet our climate goals. It's because it makes Seattle more affordable, more accessible, reduces congestion, and gives people real choices. Today, Seattle is a leader in transit ridership. Yep. <clears throat> the reason is because we are making the investments that we need. We put a free ORCA card in the hands of every Seattle Public High School student. And we expanded free ORCA for our low-income neighbors. We are working to bring more sound transit light rail online as quickly as possible. We've increased Metro bus service by 32% in two years. That's progress. A big part of this progress, the reason we can take action, has been the success of our voter-approved Seattle Transportation Benefit District. Thank you, voters. This year, that law and the support for the transit it provides will expire. So we will go back to the voters to secure reliable funding for transit, 
for red bus lanes, and to maintain free ORCA for all our students and low-income neighbors. In the coming weeks, I'll present a plan for how we can continue that commitment to transit. Because we have a vision for the future of Seattle and our region. A region where you never have to get in a car to go to work, to play, or to explore this great city. A region that gives seniors, people with low incomes, our neighbors with disabilities, and young people true access to jobs and education. A region with fewer cars, less climate pollution, and more safe and convenient ways to get around. We will show we believe in this future, and together we can act and we can make progress. <clears throat> Now, Seattle has always been an optimistic, forward-looking city. We are that city that invents the future. And in these challenging and divisive times, the obligation to keep making progress, real progress, has never been greater. As we look at the year ahead, I believe we can seize the opportunities before us. After all, we've done it together in the last two years. How could I not believe? We can keep showing what it looks like when progressives make progress. In this era of division, we can show people how to come together to do big, hard things. We can show the power of kindness, of love, compassion. As Heather said, let's open our hearts. In this era of distrust of government, we can restore trust by showing real progress, real results, and making lives better. This year, together, let's recommit to doing just that. Let's build that better Seattle together. Thank you so much.